tracking the changing nature of the virus. As we kick off the month of August, the most transmissible variant yet continues to circulate around the globe. And although reinfections have been common with BA5, we're going to talk about the likelihood of rebound cases, like we saw with President Biden. And developing tonight, monkeypox was just declared a public health emergency in two major cities, leaving health officials scrambling for vaccines. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We are glad you're with us. Joining us tonight, as always, world-renowned doctor Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And a little bit later on tonight, our special guest is Dr. Chris Cradiville, who serves as the chair of the Global Center for Health Security at UNMC. You at home, you're a big part of our show. In just a little bit, we're going to open up our phone lines and take your questions. But first, let's get to the latest data. Dr. Gold, how are the numbers here at home and around the world tonight? Well, thank you, Christina. It's great to be with you and it's great to be with our audience. And I just want to take a minute to thank all those who write in, call in, uh, communicate with us through social media. Just to let you know, we read every one of your messages and listen to every one of your calls. And we're very, very grateful for that. So with that, let's dig into the global data. There's a mixture of some good news and some concerning news tonight. So if we look at the worldwide map, it's very similar to what we've been seeing for now weeks after weeks, even months uh, since the late spring, uh, early summer. And that is uh, very intense coloration in Central Europe, uh, all throughout the Far East, uh, a good part of South and Central America. Uh, and then, of course, the United States uh, and all of the uh, Pacific Islands and uh, and Alaska as well. If we look at the numbers worldwide, uh, what we see is that the overall cases uh, in the 14-day running average are up another 6%, just over a million cases confirmed per day. Uh, if we look at the deaths worldwide, the total deaths confirmed are now up 24% over the last 14-day period, or over 2,300 confirmed deaths, uh, bringing us to a worldwide total of just under 6.4 million uh, confirmed deaths. Hard to believe that we're now two and a half years into this pandemic worldwide and that these numbers really unfortunately underestimate the toll of total cases and total deaths. When we start to look at uh, our country, uh, the map looks quite red and quite orange and quite amber uh, and continues to change uh, particularly in the southwest, as we, as we see parts of New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, several sections, of course, uh, as we talked about last week, of Louisiana, uh, Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, uh, and even in the uh, uh, mid-Atlantic uh, and in parts of the southeast in the United States. Uh, the northeast, uh, as well as the uh, Great Lakes region, are less intense than they have been previously. And when we look at the numbers, uh, this is where the somewhat optimistic numbers come in. Uh, it looks like the 14-day running average of cases is actually down 5% over the last two weeks, uh, which week over week it's been either flat or slightly up. And so that is the good news, 123,500 American reported cases uh, just yesterday, so still a very significant number and over 91 million confirmed cases thus far. Hospitalization, uh, just under 44,000, up 7% over the last 14-day period. And of those, 5,000 are in the intensive care unit, up 10% over the last two weeks. And then finally, and we'll look at the details in just a minute, 435 deaths, up 2%, uh, to just over 1.02 million cases. Uh, of death uh, in the United States. How tragic uh, that is uh, across our nation for the families and loved ones uh, that have been involved. So, you know, if we look at the case curve uh, since the very beginning of the pandemic, of course, we see the uh, Omicron BA1 spike there at over 800,000 cases. But we've been in this flat plateau now uh, for almost two months. Uh, and it uh, goes up and down by a couple of percent, but it's been hovering around 100,000 cases uh, per day. 
When we look at some of the finer numbers at the U.S., we're at about 37 cases per 100,000 per day. Uh, Kentucky in the state, Alaska, uh, West Virginia, South Carolina, Florida are anywhere between uh, one and a half to almost twice uh, uh, the U.S. average. So there's an evening out of the number of cases, uh, even in the states with the highest numbers. But when we look at some of the smaller communities, particularly the rural uh, communities, what you see in several communities in Kentucky and Arkansas, which happen to be in the top five, although the U.S. average is at, 100 and, uh, is at 37 per 100,000 per day, uh, if you look at these smaller uh, rural communities, uh, what you can see is that the numbers are substantially higher. Again, although small numbers of cases, reinforcing the, the fact that this is very much not just an urban pandemic, but it is still very much a pandemic that when it catches on in small rural farming and ranching communities, it can really wreak havoc in terms of the rate of growth of these cases. So whether it's an outside athletic event or an indoor church service, uh, those are the types of things that are now beginning to cause these trends with the BA5 variant. You know, when we look at the U.S. wastewater number, again, a slightly optimistic number uh, in that the 20 uh, to 39 percent of the nearly 1,000 sites that are reporting are actually showing a lower number. And those in the very top category, uh, the 80 to 100 percent in the red on the bottom of this chart, are actually slightly lower than they were in the last two weeks. And again, the wastewater COVID levels have been very predictive of cases and later hospitalization and even later than that, uh, case fatality rates and uh, death. You know, as this chart shows us, we're still predominantly a BA5 nation, although we're starting to see some spread of several hundred cases of the BA 2.75, which is this newest variant that has been identified in parts of uh, Southern Africa. If you look at the U.S. map, you can see uh, uh, indicated in the dark green, we are very much BA5 in all of the uh, uh, HSS districts uh, of, the, uh, of the United States. Again, there's still a little BA2, <clears throat> there's some uh, BA4, but BA5 has outcompeted this, fortunately not in terms of case severity, but definitely in terms of the rate of transmission. And again, uh, all the virus has to do is be slightly more transmissible than the previous variant, and it will replace uh, that. And that degree of transmission is either due to vaccine breakthrough uh, or to reinfection of individuals that were previously infected. And I know we'll get to talk about this in a bit more. But I just remind our audience that the BA4 and BA5 subtypes <clears throat> are just as transmissible as measles, which means they're at least to 10 to 15 times more transmissible than the original virus uh, that was identified, believe it or not, back in December uh, of 2019. Hard to believe that much time has passed. When we look at U.S. hospitalization rates, you can see that the curve is still rising. There may be just the tiniest inflection of plateauing there. Hopefully that will be true. We'll have a better idea in the next 14 days uh, when we look uh, uh, at those uh, averages. If you look at ICU rates uh, in the, on this graphic, you can see that they're pretty plateaued uh, across the nation, and they haven't gone down uh, as low as we would like to see them. And, of course, those that end up in intensive care units uh, not infrequently lose their life and lose their battle uh, to this disease. If we look at U.S. hospitalizations uh, by state, we're at about 13 or per 100,000 or just under 44,000 hospitalizations. But Washington, D.C., Delaware, West Virginia, uh, Florida and Alabama are anywhere between one and a half and uh, almost uh, three times uh, the U.S. average of hospitalization. We look at the map. Again, the hospitalization density uh, is very localized, and it tends to, of course, track where the case rates are. So when we see a small outbreak in a rural uh, community, almost certainly we're going to see hospitalization going with it even if it's a reinfection, even if it's uh, an individual that may or may not have access to some of the oral medications. 
We look at the deaths, uh, again, very plateaued in the United States, certainly nowhere near as high as it was for the Delta variant uh, that we had about a year ago uh, and the Omicron variant that we had in the winter and early spring. But we haven't been able to really reduce that case fatality curve. And it just seems to show, again, that those that are most vulnerable, older age, very young age, those with comorbidities, those with uh, complex medical uh, problems that require medications that reduce their immune status tend to unfortunately be those that are getting hospitalized and those that are losing their life uh, to this disease. If you look at the case fatality by state, you again see that New Mexico, Florida, Oregon, West Virginia, and Hawaii are anywhere from uh, one and a half to two to even almost three times uh, the U.S. average. Again, very concerning because this is affecting both the rural and the large urban communities uh, with this BA5 variant. Regrettably, the U.S. vaccination status has not changed. Uh, overall, 67% uh, are of what we would call fully vaxxed, meaning either two doses of Moderna, uh, Pfizer, uh, or one dose of the J&J uh, &J vaccine. And we're still at 32% boosted, less than half the average rate of Western Europe uh, and other parts of the world who have adopted the boosters uh, far more aggressively. Uh, if we look at U.S. vaccine distribution by day, you can see the numbers are quite low. We peaked at about uh, 3.7 million uh, vaccinations per day. That was back, you know, back in the spring of 2021. We saw an increase in that over the Delta variant and then again a bit during the Omicron variant. But it's been extremely flat uh, over the last uh, several months. And again, there's really no evidence that it's rising. Hopefully, uh, when the Novavax product gets widely distributed and hopefully when some of the boosters uh, that are specifically tuned for the Omicron BA5 subtype uh, become available, which hopefully will be early fall, uh, that we'll see a boost in the number of vaccines per day. So with that, I'd like to just briefly shift gears because we've had so many call-in questions and write-in questions about monkeypox, what's going on, how many cases there are, et cetera. So let's look at the most recent data as of last night. 22,400 cases uh, worldwide, 79 countries uh, involved. And importantly, of those 79 countries, 72 of these countries are countries that typically do not have monkeypox. Indeed, only seven of the countries that have had monkeypox outbreaks previously uh, are those that are reporting cases. When you look at the world map, you see that lots of Europe, uh, large portions of South America, of course, the United States, uh, parts of India uh, and the uh, Pacific Islands, uh, again, uh, seem to be places where we're seeing outbreaks of the monkeypox virus. Shown in Western uh, Africa, you can see the areas designated with the blue dots, which typically have been areas that have had multiple monkeypox outbreaks uh, in the past. If you look at the worldwide numbers uh, since we last spoke, the United States has now got the largest number of cases. This is as of last night. I am now told that we've exceeded 5,000 confirmed cases in the United States, followed by Spain, Germany, United Kingdom, France, Brazil, uh, Netherlands, uh, and then Canada. Uh, not a position that we're very proud to be in. When we look at the United States, there are only three states now, uh, Montana, uh, Wyoming, and Vermont that have not reported monkeypox cases, uh, again, uh, widely spread, particularly uh, on the coasts. We look at it by state. You can see of the just under 5,000 confirmed cases as of midnight last night, New York State uh, had the most. California uh, follows. Illinois, Florida, Texas, Georgia, and then down to the District of Columbia. Uh, Pennsylvania, the state of Washington, New Jersey, Maryland, and Massachusetts. And new cases are being reported every day in almost every state in the country. And again, according to our colleagues uh, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, they believe that we're really under-testing uh, individuals 
who may uh, either have had high risk exposures or have actually uh, demonstrated the very typical rash that's associated with this disease. So uh, why don't we stop at this point and I very much look forward to providing more information to introducing uh, Dr. Craterville who we're so pleased to have with us tonight and of course to uh, answering questions from our viewers. Absolutely. Um, you know what, let's go back to monkeypox for a moment because you were just talking about that, Dr. Gold. How concerned should our viewers be right now about monkeypox, particularly for some of our most vulnerable, those who have a family member living in an assisted living facility or maybe a little one in daycare? How concerned should we be at this stage? You know, that's a critically important question and there's, you know, no way to really predict the future. Uh, but, you know, there are a number of things we know about the monkeypox virus. Uh, there's both, again, good news and there's concerning news. Let's start with the good news first, is that we have very effective vaccines. The, particularly the Janios product has got a low set of unfavorable reactions and a very, very high percentage of prevention of disease and prevention of serious illness and death uh, from monkeypox and smallpox, by the way, uh, for that matter. The other good news is that there are antivirals, particularly a drug called T-Pox, uh, T-P-O-X-X, -X, uh, which has been used uh, for some period of time to slow the spread of symptoms, to reduce some of the complications, to accelerate the healing uh, of the rash. And so, uh, you know, having a well-established vaccine and having at least some treatment, albeit not completely specific treatment is better than where we started with COVID, is better than where we started with avian flu, et cetera. You know, the, the downside, the bad news about this is, is one is uh, our colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention believe that we're significantly under testing right now for that. And so there are probably more cases. Uh, and, the, you know, we don't really know what the impact is going to be in the youngest population, you know, in our daycare centers or what it's going to be in our senior living facilities, because most of the cases that we've seen have been in younger or middle aged people. You know, I'm sure our audience is well aware uh, that a lot of the cases have been transmitted uh, among and between men who have sexual relationships with men or have bisexual relationships. But we're now seeing women and we're seeing younger children coming down with the disease. And so we're going to get a better experience. You know, if you look at the historic experiences with monkeypox in the areas in Western Africa that have had several outbreaks, it is significantly more severe, higher hospitalization rates and higher case fatality rates uh, than COVID, maybe as much as five or 10 times more severe and a significant amount more case fatality. The favorable piece to that is that it's harder to transmit it. It not, does not appear to be an aerosolized infection. Uh, it, it is spread mostly by droplets and contact. Uh, and again, it takes relatively close contact particularly with people who are demonstrating the monkeypox rash. And so it, it's a sort of a mixed scenario. I guess in the best of all cases, it goes away as quickly as it came and we never hear of another case. Uh, we have all the vaccines that we need and that when indeed there is somebody who's ill, we have antiviral medications. You know, in a more severe situation, uh, we could see continued spread because these numbers continue to rise on a day by day and week by week basis with transmission rates uh, that are concerning. You know, you think about it, uh, it was about a month or maybe five or six weeks ago that we described the first cases of monkeypox being reported in the United States, and we're now up to 5,000 confirmed cases, probably as much as 10 times that if we really knew uh, what the actual numbers uh, of cases uh, were. So it's something that we're going to monitor very carefully and, uh, you know, we'll continue to report uh, to our audience, Christina, on a weekly basis. Oh, I appreciate that so much. Uh, you've been with us throughout the entire pandemic. We know you're not going anywhere. We're grateful to you for that. Let's talk about the other big story in the news. President Joe Biden experienced what is being called a rebound case of COVID after treatment with Paxlovid. Can you explain to our viewers what that is and how it's different than a reinfection specifically? So uh, reinfections are, are typically seen weeks to months after either uh, a, a 
a confirmed positive test or a confirmed illness. That is to say, you're symptomatic and you test positive, or you're asymptomatic and you test positive. You ultimately test negative, uh, go back to your work, go back to business, go back to school, whatever. And then weeks to months later, you once more get exposed, test positive, uh, and we would call that a reinfection. The rebound is something that we've seen uh, after uh, a percentage of individuals that have been treated with one of either our intravenous or our oral agents, such as what the president was treated with, which is Paxlovid, which is extremely effective antiviral agent that was developed specifically uh, for uh, COVID-19. And what makes it a rebound is that upon stopping the five-day course and testing negative, and he tested negative, I'm told, you know, from what I read in the newspapers, uh, for several days, stops the antiviral drug, and then rebounds literally within a couple of days. And uh, we call that, as I said, a rebound. Typically, it's with minimal or no symptoms, and it's a positive test. And sometimes people may become slightly symptomatic after stopping uh, the Paxlovid and test negative. In some instances, depending on the severity of symptoms, uh, the physicians uh, may prescribe another five-day course of the drug. In some instances, uh, as seems to be the case uh, in the White House right now, they're just monitoring the president very carefully, requiring, of course, him to be isolated because he could infect other individuals, uh, and, uh, and keeping a close eye on his tests and, and his medical condition. Okay. Hopefully that's helpful. Oh, absolutely it is. I think sometimes um, you get pneumonia or you get a really bad cold and then all of a sudden you're getting better and then you get sick again. I think sometimes we call that a relapse, but it sounds like this is different because it has more to do with the actual medication than anything else. Is that correct, Dr. Gold? Well, there's a, you know, there have been multiple different reports between 10 and about 20 percent of people that have taken these oral agents such as monopiravir or Paxlovid, uh, and uh, after they stop taking it, they recur with symptoms. So whether you want to call that a relapse, whether you want to call it a, a rebound, I mean, they're, you know, the, these are all terms of art that, that are somewhat blurred. The long and the short of it is, upon stopping the medication, he and a good number of others uh, who have taken this medication, and by the way, have gotten a spectacularly good effect from it, in terms of lowering viral titers, preventing hospitalization, and minimizing the severity of the illness, that they pop up again with symptoms and or a positive test. So, uh, you know, we're choosing to call this a rebound because it's occurring immediately after cessation of taking the drug. Okay, interesting. And we love your terms. I don't think that uh, most Americans knew a lot of these terms before going into this pandemic. So if anything, you've done a really good job of educating us. We appreciate being able to speak like a doctor. So thanks for that. Now we're going to pause for a quick break, but now it's your turn. We want to hear from you tonight. We're going to open up our phone lines to your questions. Any question that you might have about monkeypox, about the virus, 877-731-6733. We'd love to hear from you tonight. And when we come back, Dr. Chris Cradiville, the chair of the Global Center for Health Security at UNMC will join our conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome tonight's special guest, Dr. Chris Cradiville. He wears many hats at UNMC and the Global Center for Health Security. He is the distinguished chair, and he served as the chair of the Big Ten Conference's Task Force for Emerging Infectious Diseases. He is well-trained, and he trains others well. Welcome back, Dr. Cradiville. We're so happy to have you on again. And we know that you do a lot of training of federal medical personnel at UNMC. Tell us about the work that you're doing right now with National Disaster Medical. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a long-term collaboration with multiple branches of the federal government, including the, the NDMS, the National Disaster Medical System. And that's a, a group of folks who are volunteers, kind of like the National Guard. They get called up and activated to help in mass casualty situations and in floods and disasters. And uh, so that's a group that we have uh, been training since 2015 in preparing for special pathogen infections like 
Ebola or during the early days of COVID. I love that. And you've also done something similar in a partnership with the Air Force. Talk a little bit about that work. Yeah, absolutely. So we're very fortunate at UNMC because throughout our collaboration through the last several years with the federal government, we've built facilities here that simulate biocontainment care, that uh, simulate actually mobile army hospital tents, if you will. So we can do training for multiple different federal agencies. So in addition to the National Disaster Medical System, we also do training with the Air Force, and there's a program called Sea Stars. And University of Nebraska Medical Center is very honored to partner with the Air Force, and we have some active duty Air Force personnel permanently stationed here with us that work side by side with us. And then also active duty Air Force teams that come here to train as a, a collaborative team and in how to manage uh, these kind of patients. I love it. And I mean, that military partnership with UNMC just speaks volumes about the actual training that you're conducting. So we really look forward to tapping into your expertise tonight. We're going to go to the phones. Marianne of Georgia is our first caller tonight. Thanks for joining us, Marianne. Go right ahead. Yes, I'm talking to uh, Dr. Gold again uh, from last week. Uh, what happened is that I forgot to ask him about my husband's uh, autoimmune disease, MS. Um, and the question will be, even though we've had our vaccines and boosters, we had COVID um, the beginning of June. And um, I just wondered after that, when, how much immunity antibody should he have with the mild COVID and having had all the vaccines also? Well, thank you for calling back, Marianne, and I'm uh, sorry to hear that your uh, husband is challenged with MS. It's a disease my family uh, unfortunately knows uh, all too well. But in answer to your question, you know, uh, first of all, I would definitely talk with the physicians that are caring for your husband's MS and, uh, and those general practitioners as well in terms of the timing of a follow-up vaccine. But, you know, in, in, in you and I, in, in people that are not immunocompromised, there have been some good studies that show that antibody titers after an active infection, meaning a symptomatic infection, uh, people that uh, develop cough, sinus congestion, fever, you know, they're, they're sick enough to get tested and their tests come back positive for COVID, it looks like that their antibody levels last between two to three months. And then they have fallen off to the point uh, that, uh, that they are so low that they're not going to prevent a future infection. So, you know, just doing the math uh, on, on the back of an envelope, uh, if he was infected uh, back in June uh, and then uh, you're going to let two to two and a half, maybe three months go by. You know, let's hope that by the time these new vaccines come out in the early fall, late summer, which is, you know, what the uh, CDC and the FDA are predicting right now, although we don't know for certain until they're fully through the regulatory process, that could be good timing. But, you know, as I always say on this show, is that when someone has complex medical problems, the physicians, the clinics, the institutions that know you and your family best should make the decisions as to what medications, what vaccines, what the schedule should be. There may be other reasons based upon other medical problems uh, he has or other medications that he's on uh, that might want to do that either slower or, or faster. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, that would be our advice. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Mary Ann. That leaves a line open for you, 877-731-6733. We're going to Nevada, where Brenda joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Brenda. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, we're hearing how easy monkeypox can be spread, such as wiping your hands on an infected towel. Uh, now, it's like you said, it can also be spread by droplets from an infected person's mouth or nose. If you're standing in line at a grocery store with no mask on and an infected person in line by you coughs or sneezes, can they infect you? 
Could you also be infected by touching a contaminated shopping cart? And at a casino, if an infected person coughs or sneezes into their hand and then touches the slot machine buttons, can they infect the next person touching the buttons? So the answer to your questions, Brenda, unfortunately are sure it is definitely possible, but not likely. And the reason being uh, is the overwhelming majority of transmission of all of the pox viruses is by close personal contacts, particularly from the healing scabs and blisters uh, that are associated with the rash. However, if somebody happens to be at that stage of the disease uh, that they've got uh, fluids associated with the healing rash on their hands, uh, in their mouth, uh, in their nose, etc., and they cough and sneeze, and a su significant amount of body fluid is left on a shopping cart or on a bathroom counter or on a towel, and you happen to be unfortunate enough uh, to touch that right after that happens, uh, it is certainly possible. But what the uh, infectious disease experts are saying is that it needs to be a significant amount and that the timing uh, is critical. You know, given the relatively low number of cases that we've seen in the United States, you know, let's for argument's sake say, uh, given 5,000 reported cases, maybe the number is, people arguably say it's, it's much higher than that, but let's say it's five to 10 times higher than that. I would keep an eye on what's going on in your local community. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, an abundance of caution is good. Hand washing, as we've learned early on, is very important. Uh, staying away from foreign surfaces. But uh, again, you know, uh, I still wear my mask uh, when I go into the supermarket or the pharmacy. And, uh, and perhaps, depending upon what's going on in your local community, uh, for both the reasons of COVID and for the reasons of monkeypox, uh, it might not be a terribly bad idea. In some communities, for instance, in, uh, in California and New York, where you've seen most of these cases, we are actively immunizing individuals who are at high risk. All right. Thank you so much for that call. That leaves a line open for you. 877-731-6733. We are getting some great calls tonight. But I want to bring Dr. Craddaville back into the conversation because you had a really rare opportunity throughout the course of this pandemic. You actually got to see it through its inception. You know, you, we talk about the Diamond Princess, how a lot of, of those people were repatriated after being quarantined. They went straight to UMC. How did caring for some of those very first few cases give your medical center a jump start on research? And do we look at this virus and disease differently almost three years later than we did in those first few months? Yeah, thank you, Christina. Th those are really great questions. And I think one of the, the tremendous benefits we have of having uh, robust academic health centers in the U.S., particularly when they partner with the federal government, is we are able, able to leverage all of those resources. And in academic health centers, we focus on research, training, education, and clinical care. And we're able to bring all those together early on in the pandemic, as you, you mentioned. So as we brought uh, individuals from the Diamond Princess back to Nebraska, we're very quickly able to stand up things like uh, development of testing. So we could have the, the PCR testing that we could uh, develop those here with our scientists and Dr. Broadhurst. Uh, we're able to have our, our researchers who collect uh, aerosol samples and surface samples help to determine how it spread. And we're able to have our, our clinical researchers who were developing treatments and conducting studies of treatments like remdesivir very quickly implement those. So we're able to then take that information as we're learning it, as we're caring with these early patients, and then disseminate it to our network of academic health centers and clinicians and and really push out those learnings and then start leveraging some of those trainings that you talked about. So it really is having the, the integrated hub to be able to have the early identification, uh, work through how we, uh, we identify spread, how we identify patient care, and then sharing that information on a larger scale. Wow, I mean, 
Did you or anybody on your team ever imagine, though, that we'd still be dealing with this pandemic to this extent? Well, I have to say that we uh, we had hoped we would have had uh, successes that we would have tamped it down much earlier. But I, I think it really speaks to the importance of uh, staying on the top of our game and, you know, not taking our, our foot off the accelerator as we're continuing to address the virus. Because as we're seeing, and as uh, Dr. Gold does such a great job uh, demonstrating how the, the new variants develop, and we just have to continue to collect data, collect information, improve our diagnostics, improve our treatments and our vaccines. And as we continue to develop those resources, we're going to be able to uh, increasingly control the virus. And hopefully these vaccines that we're developing will really help uh, continue to get us back into uh, uh, our ability to lead a, a much more normal life as we have more recently. I love that. And, and I also love how we have a world-class medical facility that takes such a high interest in rural America. And so I just think it's such a beautiful thing that you're doing. The work that you do is so important and the care that you take in order to make sure that rural Americans get this information as well. It's just, I just tip my hat to you. I'm grateful to you for it. Okay, Mark from Utah joins the conversation. Now, thanks for joining us, Mark. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, uh, my question really is twofold. One, should we be concerned that maybe uh, possibly we have a gain of function application applied to the monkeypox to cause it to spread as quickly as it is? And then two, should we also be concerned relative to the number of cases here in the United States that are open borders and not being able to immunize the people or understand their immunization that maybe this could also be a, another scenario that could be bringing this into the country. Yeah, thank you for calling, Mark. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure many are asking uh, similar questions because of the rapid spread of monkeypox, not just here in the United States, Mark, but what where it was predominantly spreading outside of Western Africa, uh, in parts of Europe, particularly the United Kingdom, Spain, Portugal, Canada, and now, uh, you know, all through South America, Central America as well. And so whatever the, uh, the challenges are with, with this orthopox virus, of which monkeypox is one of them, uh, that does uh, have a very, very global uh, impact. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, what I don't know, uh, and I don't mean to be redundant about it, but just to make the point that there's nothing that I've heard, seen, or read uh, that would indicate uh, any evidence of gain of function, but it's going to take some time until all of the sequencing of these viruses is better understood, that we understand the similarities and differences from the earlier strains of uh, monkeypox uh, that have been seen uh, repetitively in uh, Western Africa. But there's a very high degree of consistency uh, in these uh, genetic sequences thus far. Now, the truth is, until we see a much larger number of cases and get the viruses sequenced, we really won't have a very precise answer to that, nor do we have a better understanding about how fast these viruses will mutate and cause additional variants, not totally differently than what we've seen uh, with the COVID uh, vaccine. And just to, you know, uh, answer your second question about our borders, uh, in the very, very early days of seeing monkeypox uh, in Western Europe, uh, in the United States, in Canada, almost all of those cases were travel related. That is to say, these were individuals uh, who, as I understand it, were legitimately uh, either visiting or living in the United States that had traveled to other parts of the world and then came here either on business or family matters. Uh, and then ultimately were confirmed uh, to have monkeypox. What we're seeing now predominantly uh, in the United States uh, is community spread. That is to say, individuals who have no travel history, uh, who live and work uh, in the country and are unfortunately uh, through close contact, uh, frequently sexual contact, spreading it to others. All right. We are going to pause for a quick break, but we still have time for your question. Not a lot of time, but if you call right now, we will hopefully be able to get you in 877-731-6733. 
Otherwise, you've got to wait till next week. So give us a call, 877-731-6733. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. We are glad that you're with us. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And joining us tonight, Dr. Chris Cradiville, the Chair of the Global Center for Health Security. And you are a big part of this show. 877-731-6733 is the number to call in with your questions. Bonnie of Illinois joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Bonnie. Go right ahead. Well, my question is, you said that um, the smallpox would be a help. How about if you had the chickenpox and you had the shingle vaccine? Does that help with any of this? Uh, good question, Bonnie. And unfortunately, the answer is no, uh, because uh, chicken pox and shingles are a whole different class of viruses. Uh, smallpox and monkeypox fall into a class of viruses called the orthopox viruses, and they are very similar. Fortunately, monkeypox is far less severe uh, and significantly less contagious uh, than smallpox is. Uh, but, you know, for those of us, myself included, who actually received smallpox vaccine many years ago, uh, and for those that have been in the military, for instance, uh, or are reservists or guard members who have been vaccinated for smallpox, is a good deal of cross-effectiveness uh, from the smallpox vaccine as well, which is why, of course, we have known very effective vaccines uh, for both monkeypox and smallpox. But previous vaccination for chickenpox, shingles, etc., cetera, uh, will hopefully keep you from getting chickenpox or shingles, but won't do anything for uh, monkeypox. All right, thank you so much for your call, Bonnie. Next up, Rich of Ohio joins us. Thanks for joining us, Rich. Go right ahead. Yes, I'm wondering if uh, there's any numbers that show that with COVID and um, being in the emergency rooms that the, uh, that the rates are increasing due to uh, people going to the emergency room and being um, infected with COVID. So I'm going to ask Dr. Craddeville to comment on this in a minute, but my experience has been uh, quite broadly across the country that our emergency departments and indeed our medical clinics have taken incredible precautions. And, you know, we at least here at our medical center monitor that type of transmission or potential transmission either from patient to staff from staff to patient or from patient to patient, either in our outpatient clinics, our emergency department, and in our medical center. And it's almost unreported. The overwhelming majority of cases that we've seen in our staff are community acquired. But I wonder, Dr. Craddeville, have you seen any reports or what's your feeling about the safety of the emergency room environment? It's something we talk about a lot. Yeah, Rich, that really is a great question. And one of our, our key uh, initiatives that we have had from very early on in the pandemic is really safety of the patients coming in, safety of the staff, which ultimately means safety of the community. And as Dr. Gold mentioned, uh, you know, we remain very rigorous with, uh, with mask wearing, with distancing, with cranking up the, the air circulation, which we know can uh, help diminish the risk. Uh, and, you know, our staff, when we're in break rooms, we're still distanced and having smaller numbers if you're going to have your mask off to eat. And, uh, you know, we continue to have our mask with us and, and wear it while we're here to really diminish the spread both uh, from the patient to the health care provider, health care provider from the patients. And, and we certainly have patients who are here and their visitors wearing masks as well to help limit that. But really a great question because it's really important that we address that. You know, I do wonder, just speaking on that vein, how has pandemic fatigue or safety fatigue played a part in the spread of the disease or it's staying with us? Is the fatigue that we're all experiencing, the fact that we're just going out there and living our lives regardless, is that setting us back? And by how much, Dr. Craddeville? Yeah, so great question, Christine. And I think the the fatigue is very real, but there's a lot of things that we can do to to modify our behaviors in fairly easy ways and still limit the risk. So for example, 
Uh, my wife and I still go out to restaurants a lot, but we, we eat outside whenever we can. Uh, if we are in crowds, we will have our mask on. And, you know, we've returned to traveling. We had a great trip to uh, Hawaii for a medical meeting recently. We wore masks in the plane all the way there, had a lot of outdoor activities where we didn't have to wear a mask. So I think the fatigue is very real and it really wears on you. But there's a lot of things that you can continue to do to to limit the risk. And that that is important because as we see, the numbers remain high. The Unfortunately, the number of folks dying daily in the U.S. remains quite high. So we, we do need to fight that fatigue and do what we can to continue to fight it while we're living as good a life as we can. Absolutely. And good for you for getting out there and donning the Hawaiian shirt, because for all the doctors out there, I feel like this is probably a good time to recharge your batteries. Dr. Gold, you can speak to this. You know, you talk about fatigue for the general population. Think about the medical community and, and what your members have gone through. You know, uh, there is no way that we can adequately thank those heroes that come to work every day uh, to help us not only care for our patients with COVID, of course, but to care for the incredible backlog that has occurred. You know, over the last two and a half years, a number of individuals, a very large number, have postponed routine testing such as mammography and colonography and many, many other uh, typical things that they would normally test. Some have even postponed vaccination of their young children uh, at the right time. And we're seeing a very large backlog of people that need their hip replaced or, or people that need their gallbladder out or need their cataract fixed. Uh, and in addition uh, to the hospitalization load, and that has really worn out, burnt out uh, just a countless number of healthcare professionals who are just physically tired, emotionally stressed. And don't forget, they have their own issues of their family. Many of them need daycare, uh, which has been severely impacted as well. So for all those reasons, uh, the mental well-being uh, and the resiliency of our staff is, is critically important. And it's not to say that we don't try to address this every day, but, you know, after more than two and a half years of fighting this battle, it is truly exhausting. And it'll have long-standing impact, regrettably, in terms of the time it will take for people to bounce back with their full spirit and their resiliency. Mm. Oh, we sure have a greater respect for the medical community because we have seen that resiliency firsthand. Myron of California joins the conversation now. Thanks for joining us from the Golden State. Go right ahead. Yes, uh, I, Dr. Gold, you mentioned that you're beginning to immunize people at risk for, COVID, for uh, monkeypox. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm 81 years old, and I've had... Uh, a uh, uh, smallpox vaccine when I was a kid, you know. And uh, so I wanted to know if I'm one of those people that ought to be immunized. So the best answer, Myron, of course, first of all, thank you for calling. Uh, uh, the best answer would be from your local health care professional. I think most of the people that have been immunized on the coast are people that have multiple sexual partners and particularly men uh, who have sexual uh, relationships with other men. Uh, I predict uh, that over time that will change and that we're going to start to see older populations and younger populations who just by sheer contact spread uh, are going to start to test positive, which may create a larger demand for vaccines. But even currently, the demand that we're seeing, particularly uh, on the east and west coast of the country, where the largest case numbers are, uh, has been uh, in that particular category. The other category that we've seen uh, is actually in individuals who are healthcare professionals uh, who may be caring for patients with this disease, and some of them have uh, been immunized uh, or are requesting. Uh, immunization as well. You know, uh, I would again uh, ask you to reach out to your local health care professionals uh, and ask their advice. Now, the good news is uh, the Golden State, California, has a good amount of vaccine. So if your care team thought you were appropriate, uh, they likely could get it for you. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Myra. Next, we're going to Ohio to talk to Ron in the Buckeye State. Go right ahead, Ron. 
Hi, Doctor. Uh, my question is, is uh, President Trump, when he got COVID-19, he was treated with hydrochloroquine. How come you can't get hydrochloroquine now to be treated for COVID-19? You know, uh, I don't know, Ron, uh, what President Trump was treated with. My recollection was that he was treated with a combination of drugs, including monoclonal antibodies uh, at that time, uh, and possibly some remdesivir, uh, which, uh, you know, again, was one of the early drugs that we had helped do some of the clinical testing uh, on here. You know, we've uh, had the opportunity to look at the science uh, on the chloroquine family of drugs and the uh, impact on prevention of COVID, the impact on mild disease to prevent it from becoming severe disease, and then also on the impact of individuals who are hospitalized with severe disease. And my recollection of the science that we've shared uh, is that it really has not shown uh, an, an impact in any of those categories, unlike the monoclonal antibodies, unlike the Paxlovid and the monopiravirs. You know, there are so many really good drugs that are available now, Ron. That should be really your first choice of drugs that are specifically and intentionally made to treat COVID. All right. Thank you so much for that call. We appreciate it. We have just a few moments left. I wanted to give each of the doctors an opportunity to share your final thoughts with our audience tonight. Dr. Gold, let's start with you. Well, just to express thanks to you uh, and to the RFD TV for allowing us to continue to provide this information to rural America. It is so critical that the communities that we serve across our nation have accurate and timely and scientifically based information. And then people and healthcare professionals make their own decisions, but at least they have access to that critically important information. And also special thanks to Dr. Craterville for all that he and the Global Center for Health Security do to keep our community and our nation safe. Yeah, and Dr. Craterville, I might ask you this since we have a little bit of time, what are you most excited about right now at the Global Center for Health Security, UNMC's campus? Well, Christina, one of the things that you commented on earlier was you thanked uh, me for reaching out to rural America. But really, one of the things I'm more excited about is our partnership with uh, really rural America and, and thanking, uh, you know, folks uh, out in the community for partnering with us because it really is a partnership. And if you look at some of the early work we did when there were outbreaks in packing plants, for example, uh, you know, we had teams that went out into the community and it really was a partnership with identifying where the risk was, how it was being spread, how we can protect workers and really uh, keep America moving. And, and we did that in a number of different uh, partnerships, whether it was with colleges and cities and in uh, rural America or with uh, critical infrastructure like uh, electrical plants or airports, things like that. And if, if you'll remember, about a year ago, we were talking about our team was partnering with Cheyenne Frontier Days. And I think it really is very much that partnership of coming together and being able to work together to fight these diseases and to fight these outbreaks. And, and I guess that's what uh, excites me and uh, makes me motivated to keep moving on. Well, I'm excited to know that there's someone as passionate in his field as you are, and you're helping us, you're helping rural Americans. Dr. Gold, that's what you do every day as well. Thank you both for joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Dr. Chris Crowdeville.